here to discuss all. James Homan, a national political correspondent for The Washington Post, who joins me now uh, to uh, discuss, again, these very... Uh, two very different responses to this issue, uh, uh, James. You know, this is in fact the first that uh, we've heard the president-elect even tacitly acknowledge that perhaps a cyber attack did take place. But what do you make now of this divide we're seeing? It, it is really amazing. I mean, the, the saying, you know, it's an understatement, what you just said, which is kind of a, an amazing thing in and of itself. Uh, Donald Trump has let this, I think, very clearly become a super politicized debate about Russian interference in the election, uh, even invoking the election, invoking the contents of these hacked emails. And a lot of people, even Republicans in Washington, sort of caught off guard by just the, the nakedly political response to what the president said, uh, which is, you know, what you would expect kind of any president to say when someone interferes with this country's sovereignty. Uh, and, it, and it's a reflection of just how hard it's going to be to get answers. This is uh, something where the water has now been so muddied. And Trump really believes every time we talk about Russia and its involvement in the election that we're somehow questioning the legitimacy of his victory, which we're not doing, which the president's not doing. Uh, it's just th this deeper issue of a country playing such a role in this election and how do you stop it from happening in the future? Trump isn't ready to get to that stage of the discussion. But, you know, James, interestingly, you even said uh, you attributed then to Donald Trump perhaps the, the, the thing that he or how he experiences it. And I just wonder if we see this, for instance, his response just today, it seems a straw man argument is presented every single day, something else obviously to discuss. But uh, certainly his diametric opposition to the idea of hacking to have ever happened at all for so very long suggests uh, something uh, far greater, I suppose, as it relates to uh, Russia and certainly the a proxy battle that we might see now with the confirmation hearing of Rex Tillerson. Right. Well, you know, Trump, the, one of the things that's peculiar for political analysts is, you know, why doesn't Trump just say it's terrible if Russia hacked? I don't know for sure. It's terrible that they did it. Uh, let's never let it happen again. His, his kind of dragging his heels in like this does mean that Rex Tillerson, while he's probably more likely than not to get confirmed, a lot of Republicans sort of falling in line, it is going to mean very contentious confirmation hearings. Also, this issue isn't going away. Congress has an appetite to look into what happened. The government, the intelligence community continues to investigate it. Trump wants to make this problem go away. Uh, that's hard to see. Also, the relationship with Russia is now going to be front and center uh, in the foreign policy space in 2017. And this is going to kind of hang over it. E every decision that President Trump makes related to Russia is going to be viewed against this backdrop. That's a tough place for him to be. It's also, you know, you sort of think playing it out, inevitably the United States is going to do things that upset the Russians. What's going to happen when Russia sort of turns on Trump and, and doesn't see him as the ally that they do now? How will Trump then respond to that? These are all questions we're going to have to wait and see play out in the next year. Well, interestingly, it's not just Rex Tillerson. Much has been made, of course, of what we might see in his confirmation hearing and the fact right. that, uh, as he's really acknowledged, that he ran ExxonMobil as something of a corporate sovereign with a foreign policy unto yeah. itself. But also, we are going to see confirmation hearings of James Mattis as Defense right. Secretary, John Kelly uh, for the Department of Homeland Security, and certainly questions about, if nothing else, confidence in the intelligence community will will be will be asked and raised in those hearings as well it seems it seems that the president elect will not be able uh will be forced to pivot at some point yes well yeah it's it's going to be awkward because you're going to have this situation where these guys on capitol hill are going to be saying you know i trust the intelligence community i believe their assessments i have a lot of friends in the intelligence community while their boss is continuing to publicly question them and that's going to be a scab that we're going to end up having to pick for the next three months. Uh, and it's, you know, you mentioned those three all true. Also, Mike Pompeo, uh, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and Trump still hasn't named the person who's going to run the Defense Intelligence Agency and sort of the, the overall intelligence community, the, the director of national intelligence. And so all of those confirmation hearings present you know, difficult choices for these nominees, many of whom have spent their careers working with 
intelligence professionals and are going to be in this awkward position. Uh, and we saw Lindsey Graham, one of the Republican senators from senator from South Carolina, say yesterday he will only support Rex Tillerson for secretary of state if Tillerson agrees to commit to keep in place the sanctions that the U.S. put on Russia after they invaded Crimea in the in Ukraine in uh, 2015. So we're not it's not just going to be a debate about hacking in the intelligence community. The Trump folks are going to have to go on record before they take office saying where they stand on some of these big policy issues. It's not like you say something during the campaign and then you come in and govern in a different way. During your confirmation hearing, if Rex Tillerson says we're going to keep in place the sanctions on Russia, it is very, very difficult for the administration to then reverse course on that. And we should also note Rex Tillerson, again, as uh, ExxonMobil chairman and CEO, stood opposed to the sanctions that you uh, so mentioned. Yeah. I also wonder, as we did not hear from the president-elect yesterday anything about his uh, business interests and the conflicts mm -hmm. of interest that those may or may not pose yesterday. And as we now are sitting here discussing uh, what feels an increasing reality, straw men, obfuscation, misdirection, what impact could the continued uh, delay in discussing how he might divest himself uh, as has traditionally been the case of the highest office in the land. What impact could those decisions have as we see this uh, strategy play out with regard to a Russian response? I think Trump is testing the boundaries. He's testing the limits. He, he's new to it. He's seeing how far he can go, what he can get away with. The reality is he got elected president of the United States despite not releasing his tax returns. It ultimately, I don't think cost him many votes. And it is difficult for him to divest it's hard for him to put some of this stuff in a blind trust. He wants his kids to be involved in, in all of these businesses. Uh, so he's, he, he's trying to see what he can get away with. And I think right now he's testing. You know, he canceled the press conference that was supposed to happen this week and said it's going to happen in January. Is he actually ever going to have that press conference or is he just going to sort of hope to move on and, and get away from it without enough pressure on him? And I think as long as... Congressional Republicans who have a majority in the Senate and are poised to confirm as nominees are willing to look the other way and not do sort of the basic oversight. Trump's going to continue to to do all those things that you talked about, including obfuscate. And again, it should also be noted that he did so yesterday tweeting that he doesn't understand why the media thinks it's uh, such a complex question in direct opposition to the very reason his senior <laughs> advisor gave for, uh, again, the delay in that press conference in the first place. I want to get you out of here, James, on this one then. Our new CBS uh, News poll, yes, polling is back. It shows now that uh, President Obama, uh, his approval rating stands at 56 percent. That's the highest since uh, this month, four years ago, in the immediate aftermath of his reelection. Um, what impact uh, will that optic, an all-important thing to the president-elect, to be sure, have on the incoming administration, do you think? It was fascinating last night in Hershey, Pennsylvania, at the latest rally on his thank you tour. Trump sort of responded very forcefully to Josh Ernest criticizing him on Russia. And he said, Josh Ernest must not be talking to Barack Obama. You know, Obama wouldn't say that. Obama's been talking to Trump a lot, trying to help him through this process. Uh, Trump has shown some some respect for the president. I think the president is trying to to be as close to him as he can and in terms of helping shape his direction, maybe getting him to to trim back some of his promises. And an unpo a very popular Obama makes it harder for Republicans to roll back certain pieces of Obama's legacy. So I think Obama recognizes that he wants to end on as high a note as possible. Washington Post, James Homan, very much appreciate the time and insight, James. Have a good weekend.